So thank you all for having me. Um, can you all hear me all right? Um, so I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you all about how water can be secured for people and nature here in California. Uh, the, I know these topics that the UNESCO comes up with can be pretty broad, and so I want to try to make it as concrete as possible. Um, so to, before we start, I want to take a little survey of who, um, of who here has um, made a New Year's resolution this year. If so, raise your hand. No. <laughs> <laughs> Unambitious, okay, well, we got one uh, ambitious person here. Um, now I'm going to put you on the spot. So, well, before I do that, who made, think they, think they made one, but forget what it was. Okay, so there's, there's more people. Um, and for you, uh, did you keep your New Year's resolution, or are you, is it still a work in progress? So far, so good. Okay, good. Um, so what, what do you think has made it oh, uh, successful so far? Okay, um, so one of the things that usually happens when people make a New Year's resolution is that they set these really big lofty goals, like I want to lose you know, weight, or I want to run a marathon, but if you don't set metrics and milestones to meet, then oftentimes you don't accomplish that goal. And the same thing happens um, when securing water uh, for, for people and nature. So over the last uh, couple decades, a lot of governments have started to realize the importance of, uh, that water plays for nature. And although these um, policies have started to incorporate nature into, the, into them, the, in actually implementing them, they haven't really been that successful. And part of that is because metrics haven't been set and um, clear goals and, and milestones haven't been made. And so today I'm going to present present some of the work we're doing at the Nature Conservancy to help water agencies make more concrete goals and more specific um, milestones that are quantitative so that they can actually succeed in implementing sustainable water management. So who is the Nature Conservancy? I'll admit, before I started working there, I didn't really know who they were either. Um, but it's actually a really impressive organization. We've been around since 1951 and we're the largest environmental NGO in the world. And we are protecting 82 million acres worldwide. Um, we work in 72 different countries. And our main strategy for protecting nature is to buy it uh, and protect it. And so, for instance, like the Marin headlands that are now uh, undeveloped, we per first purchased that uh, and made sure that they were on a path towards uh, uh, being protected. And so uh, here in California, we actually own uh, around 500,000 um, um, acres. And um, our latest ones have been, the, our last purchase that we got was the largest um, donation that we've ever received. Uh, we bought the, what's now known as the Dangerman Preserve. It's 24,000 acres at Point Conception. It was, um, there was a donation made by the folks that um, created uh, ArcGIS. I don't know if any of you are familiar with them. The Dangermans. Um, and so, and then we also own uh, another impressive asset that we have here in California is our Santa Cruz Island, which is one of the Channel Islands. We own pretty much half of it. And this cute little fox here in the middle was um, one of our recent victories. We got him off the endangered spe uh, species list. So, um, and he lives on Santa Cruz Island. So, <laughs> this is a good story there. Um, so, in addition to purchasing properties, we also are very science-led. We're a very science-led organization. We have 600 scientists on staff, and we work on a wide range of, of topics related to energy, climate change, water, agriculture, and, um, and oceans. And, and so our main um, conservation strategy has been to purchase land, but we also are very solutions-oriented, and so we use science to help guide our decisions on how to partner with agencies and, and um, and come up with um, solutions that work for people and also for nature. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of one of our, our, our properties. So one of the advantages of owning property is that you become a local stakeholder, and you get to really understand what's happening on the ground. And um, we, we have a property that we own in, along the Santa Clara River in Ventura County. And it has, uh, it looks. I think I need a mouse here. 
So this is what it looked like in a couple years ago, in 2016, in the height of the last drought. Now, like I said, we like to protect properties. We like to purchase properties to protect them. And this isn't really what protection looks like. Right? There's a lot of dead trees and shrubs. And as, you, as we get higher up in the air, this is some drone footage, you can see that the damage is quite extent, uh, expansive. And in the middle, I don't know if you can see the, I don't know if this will, yeah, it won't work on the screen. In the middle, you'll see the riparian, the river corridor. And so what's essentially happened here is that the groundwater levels have, have been drawn down too far that the ecosystem can no longer access the groundwater levels. Um, and so this ecosystem depends on groundwater, and this is why we call them groundwater-dependent ecosystems, because when the groundwater goes away, so does the ecosystem. And so this isn't really what protection looks like. Um, we use private money and public money to purchase these properties and, and with, the, with the promise that we'll save them and, uh, and protect them in perpetuity. And so when this kind of thing happens, you know, our, our staff got really concerned and trying to understand what's causing this. And, and so when there's, since there's been decisions made on how water is being allocated and, um, across California, that's why we've gotten very actively engaged with the sustainable groundwater management because it has a direct impact on uh, our ecosystems. So this isn't an isolated case. Groundwater levels have been dropping throughout the state and not just um, having impacts on ecosystems, but also our communities. And so this uh, is a figure of uh, groundwater levels in Paso Robles, which is a really big wine region. Um, the dark red indicate deeper groundwater levels, and the lighter orange levels are shallower groundwater levels. And so this is what's called a cone of depression. It's when water is being sucked out of the ground and the groundwater levels um, get deep. And and so this has had impacts to local um, communities and uh, people trying to access water for drinking and even um, for agricultural purposes. And so this is what the state has identified as an unde undesirable result or deadly sin, as some like to throw around. Uh, and there's six of them that the state has identified. So this is the first one. And I'm going to talk about two other ones really briefly that are pretty relevant to groundwater-dependent ecosystems. So the next um, uh, undesirable result is degraded water quality. So this is a map of the Central Valley in, in California, where um, it's a map of total dissolved sol solutes. So it's kind of an indicator, broad indicator of water quality. Um, generally, if you have more salty water or more nitrates in the water, you'll have higher total dissolved solvents, or TDS. And the western edge of the Central Valley is, is pretty not is notoriously got high um, salts and um, other uh, contaminants um, that aren't only a problem for people trying to access water for drinking, but also for the farmers themselves. A lot of them are, there's a lot of um, desalter facilities that are being put up across the state in order to deal with this saline groundwater. And another undesirable result is surface water depletion. So this occurs when wells located near a river, in some cases not even really right next to it, but further inland, um, will are, when the water is taken up from the well, it'll pull water away from rivers, and, and then the rivers go dry. So that, that's obviously a problem, not only for ecosystems, but also for surface water users. So depletions of surface water, um, like in the example I showed from our property in the Santa Clara River, have been occurring over the past century. And research has shown that uh, many of the wetlands and uh, riparian habitats that used to exist in our Central Valley have drastically decreased. So in this map, the, this is the map of the Delta region. It's the confluence of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers. And it, it used to be mostly freshwater wetlands, but it was converted mostly to agriculture over the past century. And what's left is five, less than 5% of wetlands that used to be there, and also 6% um, of riparian habitat. So that's like trees and um, uh, other um, in-stream fauna 
um, in, in these aquatic systems. So I'm not trying to say that agriculture is bad. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with agriculture. But what I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that natural, the, uh, the natural ecosystems that are actually remaining are a very, very small pr proportion of what we had historically. And so it's really important that we protect these last remaining um, ecosystems. And, and groundwater pumping has really caused a lot of this. And so it's really great that Sigma is you know, tackling this. And it, it's kind of a. It's kind of the elephant, in, white elephant in the room in a lot of, a lot of times because so before our, our institutions have been set up so that it's like surface water and groundwater don't really interact, but when in fact they're really one uh, integrated resource. And so our legal um, systems haven't really, um, really been helpful in, in making that easy for water managers. So luckily, Sigma was passed in 2014. Um, and it happened during the drought when everyone was feeling the impacts of the, dr of the drought, um, mostly. And prior to Sigma, groundwater law was uh, mostly entirely driven by court decisions. So people would sue each other, and then they would decide how much water everyone got. And literally, a, a judge decides like, how much water people get uh, instead of a, a water manager. And, and and, so, and also, over the past several decades, there have been um, voluntary local decisions to manage groundwater. So there are some entities throughout the state that have been managing groundwater for quite some time, but then others that have done it, they have never even you know, done anything with it. So under Sigma, uh, local agencies known as groundwater sustainability agencies are tasked with um, halting six, the six undesirable results that I had referred to before which are listed down here below in, in, as icons. Um, and so the notion is that local agencies understand their local groundwater basins best. I mean, we have a massive state, totally different cultural and political values, different land use practices, different ecosystems, different hydrologic systems. We have deserts. We have practically temperate rainforests. And, and so it really it, it doesn't make sense for the state to really manage all, all of this. So they've tasked the locals with doing it. And it's actually something that's really valued um, here in California. Local control is a really big motivator, and people um, want that. So the, the notion is, is that if the agencies can't manage their aquifers on, and reach s sustainability, then the state will come in and do it for them. And so this local control is a really big motivator. So nobody wants mom and dad <laughs> state agencies to come in and, and slap them on the wrist and take over. They want, everyone wants to be able to do it themselves. So, but ironically, California was the last, eco, uh, sorry, the last uh, state in the entire United States to pass comprehensive groundwater legislation, even after Texas, which is <laughs> always a shock. Um, but, we, even though we were the last, we, we were, we're actually quite ambitious at, um, in how we've set up the law in, in regards to groundwater dependent ecosystems. So we're the only state in the entire United States to specifically recognize groundwater dependent ecosystems in our law, and one of the few internationally. So we've really, you know, we've fallen behind, but we're like, we're setting ourselves ahead for a very, um, uh, as leaders in this in this field, and so so groundwater dependent ecosystems, uh, they're now a required element for groundwater sustainability plans. So these are the plans that the locals need to submit to the state agencies to prove that they're being sustainable by 2040. They have to do them every five years. Um, agencies now have to incorporate. Um, identify and consider groundwater dependent ecosystems in those plans by mapping them and considering how the um, groundwater conditions in the basin are impacting them and also monitor whether or not impacts are happening. So at TNC, we recognize that GSAs are going to be addressing GDEs for the first time. This is, I mean, how often do a biologist and a geologist and hydrologist talk? Not really. You think like earth science, we're all, you know, everyone's doing the same stuff, but it's very siloed. Um, and so uh, there is, hasn't really been a lot of work done on understanding the eco-hydrology of these systems. 
So we've been working really hard at TNC to help bridge that gap, that knowledge gap, and we've developed some tools and resources in order to help agencies uh, be able to incorporate uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems into their sustainability plans. So we've developed this guidance document um, that uh, provides a systematic and defensible approach for, for agencies to incorporate, them, uh, incorporate these ecosystems into, into their plan. Uh, and also to help them be transparent in their decision making so that when local environmental stakeholders come and ask them, hey, what did you do with, our, with this ecosystem that we thought we had, they have a, they're able to report and, and document their decisions on, that were made along the way. And also to the state, um, the Department of Water Resources, who's going to be reviewing those plans. So, so through the development of this document, we had the privilege of working um, on the Fox Canyon Groundwater Sustainability Agency plan in Ventura County. Um, and my colleague Sally Liu serves on their technical advisory group. And an ad hoc um, committee was created in order to figure out how do we address these GDEs under Sigma. And so in working with them, we came up with four design principles in creating this document. One, we wanted it to be consistent with Sigma and the the GSP regulations. So the GSP regulations are basically the rules um, of, of, of how the, the plan should be structured for submittal. Second, we wanted it to be based on best available science, uh, but also not um, too laborious. Um, we wanted it to be practical and easy to use. And then um, fourth, we wanted it to facilitate local control. So we wanted uh, we want this document to be able to help people make local decisions. And so we tried, we, we made a very um, strong point not to be prescriptive in this, telling people what sh they should be doing. Because the locals know best. We just need to help facilitate them um, to do a good job by giving them the information they needed. So I don't know if you guys had lunch. I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> um, but. So I like to think of the groundwater dependent ecosystem guidance process as a Chipotle experience. Um, so Chipotle, you know, it, they have this customizable menu. So you can come in as a vegan, gluten-free, paleo diet, or you could be training for like a sumo wrestling match, and you can walk away happy. And um, they're they're catering to the fact that everyone likes likes choice um, and has a personal preference, but they want folks to stay within the menu at the same time. And so you can, have, you can have control on what type of beans that you have in your burrito, but you can't order Chinese food you know, from the Chipotle counter. So similarly, uh, under Sigma, basins are coming in with very different local um, values and very different hydrologic conditions. And so they're all going to be reaching sustainability in a different way. And so some GSAs might want the leanest environmental considerations. But others might want the works. They might want to enhance their GDEs so that they are very biodiverse and, and rich places. So we've designed our do guidance doc document to be customizable so that agencies can um, can incorporate them so, so that their the, the values that are locally held are reflected. Um, but that doesn't mean that just because you don't like ecosystems, you can you know let a threaten an endangered species go. There are definitely limits. <laughs> um, and so you can't you know, um, uh, infringe upon pre-existing laws like the Endangered Species Act. So I'm going to quickly go through the, the guidance document. It's five steps. And um, the first step <clears throat> is mapping where they are. So you can't manage what you don't know what you're managing. So the first thing is to put them on a map. And we've been involved with this for some time. My colleagues, uh, Jeanette Howard and Matt Merrifield um, at TNC, are, were the first people to map groundwater dependent ecosystems in California. And uh, this really helped us understand where they were and uh, how they're being impacted. And now the map is being updated. We worked in partnership with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and also the Department of Water Resources. That's the agency that's going to be reviewing the plans. And they are providing technical assistance to GSAs to be able to do a good job. So this data set is now going to be available on their website. Um, 
in the coming weeks. It's getting finalized right now. So it's statewide, and um, in this process, we've learned that these GDEs are, um, are quite biodiverse hotspots. Um, so they, we found that in the alluvial groundwater basins across California, that these um, groundwater dependent ecosystems represent only 6% of the groundwater basin area, but they provide habitat for 90% uh, of threatened and endangered species. So they're really ecologically important for our threatened species and, and other species as well. So as a local, you know, you're not working at this huge scale, you're working in your basin, your groundwater basin. And so you take, the first step is to take that statewide map and then refine it using local information to confirm if there's actually a connection to groundwater. And then you fill in any, any data gaps or remove things that look kind of not right. And then you consolidate these, these polygons that have been mapped at the statewide level into you know, kind of like functional GDE areas. So you might have a, a few polygons that represent a spring. You might have a few polygons that represent a wetland. So you group those so that it's more easy to manage um, moving forward. So we call them GDE units. And then the next thing you want to do is characterize their condition. So um, we have them do this using biological information. We provide some uh, suggestions of where to look to find out what types of uh, species are there. And um, because all G G GDEs are not created equal, you have some that are very biologically rich. Um, groundwater is the only source of water for that ecosystem. And, and, and then there's other s ecosystems that are kind of just like very f fractured, marginal quality, and maybe um, also reliant on, on another source of water, like irrigation runoff. And so we have them rank this so that when, they're, when it comes time to make a decision on how to, where to put monitoring wells and where to invest money to protect your ecosystems, you, can, you know which ones are the highest value. And so we have an example here. This is Ash Meadows National Wetland Refuge. A wildlife ref refuge, it's a, uh, it's a spring, groundwater spring. So it's, it's definitely 100% groundwater fed. Um, there's no surface water around it. And there's a desert pupfish, he's, which is a threatened um, and endangered species. And, um, and so that we would consider that high value because if the groundwater goes away, there, that ecosystem is um, highly threatened. Um, a moderate ecological value, this is something that's, you know, there's, there's stuff that's there that um, has been locally uh, determined as being um, a beneficial use or sig locally significant. Uh, but some of the species are also using other sources of water, and so they're a little bit less vulnerable, but still vulnerable to changes in groundwater level. And then low ecological value. This is, thing, the, this is a picture of Revlon Slough. This is one of the GDEs we mapped in Fox Canyon's GSP. Uh, we've considered it low value because it's highly marginal, and it's mostly an agricultural ditch, so uh, irrigation ditch. So. Or like, all right, well, if you're going to spend money on protecting GDEs and you have, you know, you know, we have to be real, like there's not unlimited money and time to deal with everything. And so we want people to prioritize on the most important ecosystems. So the next process is to determine if, if effects are happening on these ecosystems. So just to remind you, these steps are reflectant of the, 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 the process that the the different components that the GSA has to comply with it to, to create their groundwater sustainability plans. So, uh, so this step, um, so the GSAs don't have to protect GDEs just because they're in the in the basin. If 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 they're being impacted by other things, they're only responsible for dealing with impacts to groundwater dependent ecosystems based on groundwater conditions. So if, if there's a pest that's just like coming in and eating up all the trees in this GDE, it's not really the GSA's responsibility because it's not, it's not being um, caused by groundwater change, uh, conditions. So they're only responsible for what's happening, uh, the, ca the impacts caused by groundwater. So to do that, you need your hydro hydrological data from that ecosystem in order to see how the ecosystem 
uh, is responding to these changes in groundwater level. Um, and so the notion here, or the assumption here, is that if there's little to no change in baseline conditions of, of uh, hydrologic conditions for that GDE, then the, the, the ecosystem's OK. Uh, but if there's, if there's recent trends or if there's long-term trends that you have no idea even what the baseline period is, then you need to go in and really start to understand what's going on. And, and that's why the prioritization is really important, because if you don't really know what the long-term trends are for a very marginal ecosystem, you know, it's, we would probably advise don't spend a lot of money like, you know, doing isotope work and, you know, p funding five PhDs to like <laughs> figure out what's going on. Use that money to figure out what's happening in these other more important ecosystems. Uh, the next subset is to select biological data. And this is a very foreign concept for water managers. They've never had to collect, well, many have never had to collect in biological information. And so um, based on how important that ecosystem is ecologically and also how at risk that ecosystem is to changes in groundwater level will, depend, will determine how rigorous or um, the, the data that you need to collect for this. So if, you're, if you have so a lot of uh, threatened and endangered species, it's a, on a, you know, it's a federal reserve and you, you want to, um, you, you need to find out what's happening, then you want to start hiring some biologists and getting in and doing some species monitoring and figuring out what's happening. Um, but if it's this, you know, Revlon slough where there's, you know, there's nothing really there, then just take some photos and just monitor it and it, you should be fine. But this is, of course, all up to the Department of Water Resources in terms of what's appropriate. Um, but this is what we suggest in the guidance. And then the next thing is to um, combine that data to find out what those tipping points are. So, uh, and this is really the crux of, of, of the issue is, what are the tipping points for these ecosystems? What, this is the question that water managers have. What groundwater levels do I need to maintain to make sure this ecosystem is OK? And that is the most important question and probably the hardest to answer. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you have biological data and hydrological data so you can understand the cause and effect relationships. And so a lot of research has shown that uh, there, there's a general progression in terms of how ecosystem health declines over time. So depending on how um, strong the stressor is or how, prolong or how fast it comes on will determine on uh, how the ecosystems respond. So in that example I gave at the beginning of the presentation where we had this, all those dead trees on our property, the, the, the water levels have receded too fast and too much that the ecosystem couldn't adapt to those changes and reach it, and so that's why they all died. So this is so. It's, what's important is to figure out what levels do that those groundwater levels need to be at, or what water quality conditions do we need in order to make sure that th those ecosystems don't go over this edge and towards destruction. Um, and so we've also provided some practical resources to help with this. Um, there are some examples of of where. Uh, thresholds have been set for ecosystems elsewhere. Um, here in California, Inyo County, which um, um, look, um, pr uh, manages Owens Valley, they've, um, they've established two meters and four meters as groundwater thresholds to protect the ecosystem there. Um, and then other uh, agents, um, water management systems around the world have done the same. Um, the third step is um, setting the, the quantifiable metrics. And so the first thing you need to know is what's your goal, right? Do you want to maintain these ecosystems or do you want to enhance them? And that's a local decision. And then the next thing is to figure out, based on what we know, what the thresholds are for these ecosystems, how does that relate to these six undesirable results? So they have to set, the, the GSAs have to set um, quantifiable metrics for each of these undesirable results. So to make sure that you're not having undesirable results to, um, due to groundwater level changes, what do the groundwater levels need to be? And the state says that you, the, these levels, um, setting these levels depends on how you're having impacts, uh, uh, 
you need to set the levels where you're not having any impacts to beneficial uses of groundwater. And GDEs are beneficial use of groundwater. So if you know that this riparian habitat needs 10 feet of water in order to sustain itself, you know, and that you have a, a legal significance and it's a, it's a really important ecosystem, then you know, we would advise set your groundwater threshold at 10 feet so that you're not causing an ad adverse impact. And so, and, but keeping in mind, there are lots of different beneficial uses out there. There's domestic well users, there's agricultural well users, um, there's downstream users if you're along a stream. So um, agencies are gonna have to figure out how to balance all these beneficial users and figure out trade-offs and also figure out which ones are they legally required to attend to. And so this is something that's, you know, that's gonna be very interesting to see how it plays out over time. And then the next thing is setting these you know, measurable objectives. So by 2040, they have to meet um, sustainability. So if your goal is to maintain the ecosystem, maybe you just wanna set your, your measurable objective to the baseline conditions. Or maybe you wanna be, you know, go all out and really enhance that ecosystem because it's locally important. So then you would you know, set it at whatever level it needed optimally to, 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 to um, be restored. And the, uh, the fourth step is to monitor impacts. And so um, you want to uh, make sure that biological and hydrological data is being collected in um, monitoring programs and that data gaps are being reconciled. And then the fifth is, okay, once you've incorporated all this stuff into your plan, how are you gonna implement that? So now you have all these, let's say that your groundwater levels were at 15 feet, but you said, okay, our minimum threshold is 10. Well, how are you gonna, the, the next question is, how do you actually accomplish that? And so that you could only do these things by um, identifying projects and management actions um, that can accomplish that target. So whether it's restricting pumping or whether it's building a water market so that you can trade when water's being used so that those users are getting the water they need and they're sharing water better or implementing new projects that can add water to the system like through recharge. So I have two examples here of you know, um, two types of demonstration projects that we're working on at, at the Nature Conservancy. One is um, conservation restoration practices. So this is a picture of a rundo. It's uh, an invasive species. It consumes a lot of water, um, more than native vegetation, and it also chokes the native habitat there. And it, there's, um, you can see it's pretty densely populated with this rundo. So it's really um, not, not really good for this, the ecosystem. So we, um, we got funding to get this rundo removed and we um, not only created a win for the ecosystem um, by creating a better habitat conditions for them, but we also created a, we're creating a win for the, the groundwater basin because there's more water left in the system that, because this, this water intensive crop is now gone. Not crop, but um, plant. Um, the next thing is by a uh, next, uh, type of management strategy or a project that you can implement is a recharge project. And so recharge projects have both direct and indirect benefits to ecosystems. Uh, by recharging, you can restore groundwater levels so that ecosystems can access water. You could also sustain uh, base flow uh, for important, uh, for at important times of the year to sustain the habitat there. But you also, in the process, you can uh, flooding land to recharge it into the ground you can create um, habitat. And we've, uh, we've demonstrated this through a pilot through our Birds Returns program. Um, this is a program that's been going on for several years now where we use a reverse auction to pay farmers to flood their fields to a depth of four inches for two to three weeks in the fall when there isn't really much surface water available so that migratory birds can stop there on their way uh, up and down the continent. And um, in this aerial photo on the right, you can see um, the, there's a bunch of white dots. Those are snow geese. And the, the fields that uh, are enrolled in our program 
you'll see more of these white dots on them. The, the birds are congregating on our fields versus in the adjacent fields. So it's a very successful um, project um, where we've demonstrated that these ecosystems can um, benefit from uh, paying farmers through this payment service. And, but then we thought, OK, well, maybe there's other benefits we can get from this. I mean, we're flooding the fields. Maybe there's recharge that's happening. And so um, this past fall, we um, piloted um, this concept by estimating how much uh, infiltration was going on on these fields during the, 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 during the project phase, and which lasted about 30 days. And what we found was that so out of all of the water supply projects that um, you can, a, a water manager can do, it is by far the cheapest option. Um, the question now is, is where is that water going? And is the amount of water that's being uh, applied to the surface actually making it down to the groundwater table? So we're going to be um, piloting this again in the fall. We just got awarded money from DWR um, through Prop 1 to um, to work on this. Um, but it, in, one of the really great things about this is that it's not only just cost effective, but it's also highly flexible. So you're, ma you're maximizing the utility of the land uh, by paying farmers to use their water rights to apply water to their fields uh, to create this habitat. And in the process, they get paid for it. Um, and so this is a really exciting project that we've been working on and con continuing to work on. So great news. We have more resources that you can check out that I haven't really talked about. Um, the, the first two I, I briefly touched upon, the statewide indicators database, that's almost ready. And then our guidance document, which is the step-by-step -step process I just walked you through. But then we also have educational resources that um, are really helpful for explaining what GDEs are, how are they impacted by, by groundwater, and then also some other data and research um, that we've been doing uh, looking at surface water groundwater interactions. And also, we've compiled this um, database of rooting depth uh, for California free autophytes. So uh, that can help agencies figure out uh, what maybe thresholds might be for, the, for their basin. Um, or for those ecosystems in the basin. And then also some case study examples. I mean, everyone likes to hear, like, how are, how are other things, how are things, how are GDEs being dealt with across the state? So we've been compiling those so that um, those stories are, are available to learn from. And all these resources can now be found on our hub. It just got launched today. I got an email about it this morning on the way here. It's very exciting. So um, check it out, take a look. And, and please feel free to contact us with any questions or if you think something like, you know, you're all here in the university. If you're doing research that you think would really help this, uh, we're leading this research agenda where we're trying to help fill these knowledge gaps for, um, for these agencies. They're working on a very tight timeline and they don't have the resources to do extensive research. But the research that you might be doing here could really help inform them. And so I want to it's really important that we work together to really translate how research um, can help make them make their lives easier. So feel free to reach out to me if you have ideas or thoughts on that. And that's it. Thank you. So uh, that's why our two panelists take their seats. And you have two buckets of water, so you don't need to, to fight. Uh, any quick clarification question to the speaker? Um, the GD map that you have is drawing outside the main ag areas in California. I was wondering, can you help me understand what is it that's drawing down the body table in the first place? Um, so yeah, well, most of it's just pumping it out, right? And, you, and so, for farming? yes, but also for um, for drinking water purposes. But f farming does use a high proportion of water in California. I think the estimates are eighty percent. But yes, yes, but that's not where your GDEs are. What do you mean? Oh, uh, in the desert regions? Are you talking about? Yeah, it has only one GDE in the main central valley. 
Uh, maybe you just couldn't see it. It's pretty. We have they exist in GDEs exist in every single basin in in California. It's, some of them are just um, too small to see on this scale. But, uh, here we go. So this is the map. Um, wetlands are indicated in blue. Vegetation is in green. Uh, but this is an earlier picture of the map. And so in the next few weeks, we'll have the map so you can zoom in and see even what species was used in order to indicate that there might be a groundwater dependent ecosystem there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Playas in the in the in the desert are being highlighted, and there may may not be a salt flat, or there might be some vegetation there. So that's one thing I yeah. could be going on. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's a really good question. So I don't work on the like the in, the interactions with the farmers and implementing that project. So I'll have to ask my colleague. But I don't recall hearing anything about that. It seemed like very seamless. Like they just they had the water right ready and they just decided to to apply it on their um, on their land. So. Yeah, I'll I'll ask about that. No, that's a great question. Yeah. No, it's it's surface water, right? Right. So the, yeah, this is water that's already been allocated to them, so they're just using it for this purpose. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Lou and Tui, if you can, uh, it will be short. So I pick two two questions.
thank you for the opportunity and good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank hey, you for. Try to not to exceed five minutes. Sure. <laughs> this is for the video. I will try to be very brief. Uh, so the good news is in terms of the um, groundwater dependent ecosystems, actually part of my uh, dissertation was on uh, developing modeling approaches to better quantify riparian vegetation water use in uh, groundwater flow models and uh, with the work that uh, my advisor Tom Maddox did in uh, the University of Arizona and his former PhD students uh, we all uh, developed a new riparian evapotranspiration package for mod flow groundwater model that uh, uh, now is an official USGS package and uh, mod flow is a groundwater modeling code that uh, uh, actually is accepted in the court cases uh, in US. So if you use this modeling framework is, is fine. But the, we haven't uh, found, um, we haven't resolved everything because of course the models uh, are good as far as you provide good data to them. The biggest challenge is figuring out the ecology of the vegetation and that's why I think Lou is here. <laughs> Uh, to specify, okay, how much uh, water a particular species is uh, using. I think that's the biggest uh, dilemma for a hydrologist and uh, how this is uh, essentially as the groundwater level changes, what are the response of vegetation communities. We try to integrate, you know, remotely sensed observation products and everything, but really the, I think, biggest challenges that we have is how different vegetation communities respond. That's ecologists can contribute. This, but the issue with the modeling package that we did in, in Arizona was that we are not incorporating the impact of unsaturated zone flow, the soil zone beneath, you know, where the roots can access water. Uh, so my group at the moment, actually, we are using hydrologic modeling framework that we call it integrated models. So integrated groundwater, land surface, and climate models. Essentially, you can see how changes in groundwater levels impact wind speed. Uh, so the state of the art is this. So this particular model that me and my group is using called Parflow CLM, developed by Lawrence Livermore National Lab and the Community Land Model by NCAR. The biggest problem is the computational time. So the industry, unfortunately, is not using these, these modeling tools. So there is the gap between what's happening in the research environment versus uh, what the, the industry is using. But we have the capability, we have the computational power at UCR uh, to develop these types of uh, modeling project. And at the moment, actually, my postdoc is here, uh, Dr. Schreiner McGraw. He's developing an integrated groundwater land surface model for the Toluri Basin in um, southern central California. So that's, uh, we are going to have more exciting results but, uh, in the future, but this is kind of a work that we are doing at the moment. So the biggest challenge for us is figuring out what vegetation do. Did you already cover the second question? Or do you want to talk about this separately? Uh, I talk about separately. Maybe Lou can go ahead with uh, this uh, state of the art. Once Lou finishes, you can move on to the second because I need to leave for two minutes and I want to hear. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. So um, I would definitely ag agree with Hoodie that. Is this going in and out? I would definitely agree with Hoodie that um, plants are the biggest unknown here. And um, through, through modeling, I think it's easier to get an idea of how much water is in, in these aquifers. Um, but when we look at plant communities, and this pertains to some of my work, um, within a plant community, there's a broad range of drought resistance and rooting depth. And um, a good example is one site that I work at in the desert, where there are species that are rooted to half a meter and are very drought resistant. They can go months without receiving rainfall. And there are species that um, are not drought resistant at all and are basically living on groundwater. Even in, in October, their stomates are wide open and they're still transpiring. So they have a constant source of water. So even within an ecosystem, you can have very broad ranges of drought resistance and groundwater use among the coexisting species that isn't necessarily apparent until you start taking measurements. And, and so 
Um, this is something that my lab um, tends to work on is the differences among species within ecosystems and trying to predict um, if we have drought continuously intensifying in California, which species are going to live and which species are going to survive. And so I think that that's kind of the biggest challenge um, for us in, in terms of understanding where the thresholds are and applying thresholds across different types of ecosystems um, by using the species within them and the differences among those species. And I, I have to say, I, having a, a, a really nice view of this, um, this new Groundwater Act um, through Melissa's talk really kind of gave me a lot of insights into how this might work. I, I thought it was really unique, um, the, local, the, the level of local control um, that was allowed and under the state, allowing um, local agencies to set their own thresholds and then have the state approve those, um, gives them a lot of leeway. Um, I, I worry that the process of setting those um, thresholds could be so complicated that it could actually delay some of their actions. And so um, I think that the, the resources that the Nature Conservancy is putting together um, sounds like a good tool in that direction. So it sounds like you've already thought about um, some of these limitations and what tools might, might be needed to overcome them. Um, I, I, think, I think another important question is the, uh, the availability of water for recharge. Um, as rainfall becomes less predictable in California, you know, to bring these aquifers um, to a sustainable level is going to require continuous rainfall. And so with, with some of that rainfall over the past four years becoming a little bit um, less predictable and a little, a little bit more erratic, I think that this whole um, process really depends on that. And so as we do this, I hope we're not en entering into another multi-year drought before we can get um, some, some of our um, balances built up in, in those aquifers. And in terms, of, in terms of tools in my lab, um, really looking at, um, we use stable isotopes to measure uh, rooting depth, but in some cases where plants are obtaining groundwater, we can only determine if plants are shallow or, or deep rooted, not exactly where they're rooted. So I'm really curious to see this uh, rooting depth database for phreatophytes um, that's on this webpage and compare some of our data perhaps for some of those species we've measured as well to see what we can understand about their physiology as, re as it relates to their rooting depth. So. Should, um, should we go on to this second question? Maybe you can continue on and then I go to the last one. Okay, um, so this is ta talking about more about our tools at UC Riverside and how we might um, might collaborate with the Nature Conservancy to address some of these. Um, we have researchers working across nearly all the ecosystems in California. And so people, although people are working on different aspects of that, there's a tremendous amount of data um, being collected. And I think to some degree, it's a matter of synthesizing and using that data to answer questions rather than collecting more data. In some cases, we may need to go out and, and collect specific data on specific ecosystems that may be hard to characterize in terms of their thresholds. Um, but in many cases, that data may already be there and it, it'd be a question of just um, assembling them. Another really important question here that I think some of our tools um, at the university, specifically joining data and models together, um, would be predicting the thresholds of, of this vegetation. Often, um, in terms of groundwater, you may, you may not know how close you are to a catastrophic dieback until it starts to happen. And so how we link, uh, how we link the level of monitoring wells to the water supply for vegetation is, is going to be key in this. Because even by, as far as I can understand, even by measuring these monitoring wells, it doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what will be the tipping point for the vegetation. And it's something that we would want to estimate, and, but not experience to actually test it. And so that, that I see as a challenge, and that I see as a challenge that would have to be addressed by a kind of multidisciplinary team of people coming together, people who um, study plants and organisms, people who study groundwater, people who study climate, and people who study policy to kind of figure out um, what the best ways to put that information together to set these thresholds would be. Also, I just listened to the last part. I already understand what you're talking about. 
Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Uri, can you move now to the second question and maybe uh, suggest how your research can be considered or your future research uh, can be part of you know, a, a, a teamwork that may include others outside of, of our university? Sure, that would be a great opportunity to collaborate and uh, my actually my research also goes beyond what's happening in environmental sciences, uh, col uh, very close collaborations with colleagues at the School of Public Policy, that's a new thing, uh, team uh, through my research in, in the past two years that I've joined UCR and also our funding agencies actually more uh, encouraging these uh, collaborative research projects such as Infuse program through NSF and couple natural human systems. So that's what kind of actually all the proposals and funding that I have at the moment is all these interdisciplinary collaborative projects. So far I always had the climate scientists and ecologists, but now I'm forced to be with economists as well. And I think this kind of mapping effort it would be very valuable for us as well because you know within a timeline of a project uh, we don't have, don't have time to collect all of these data and also collaborations with the stakeholders to get data set at the you know, ground level also would be very important. I just want to highlight another opportunity in terms of this, um, you know, maintaining the GDEs. Uh, even if the, um, you know, in, in SIGMA there was no incentive for uh, maintaining the groundwater dependent ecosystems, we have to quantify and we have to quantify the groundwater use and uh, water use of these vegetation communities to identify what is the sustainable groundwater pumping rate is. Because without knowing this natural discharge from our aquifer, we cannot come up with better plans for um, uh, uh, identifying this sustainable pumping rate. Um, and uh, in terms of research in my group, we do a lot of uh, modeling. We use multiple data sources from field data. Uh, I have a stable water isotope um, analysis lab as well to look at uh, partitioning of evaporation and transpiration. So there is a potential to take this instrument to the field and uh, on site actually monitor. So it would be a great opportunity if PNP has some of these sites that we can install these, these instruments. These are quite expensive, to close to $200,000. So I always worried about the safety that I don't want to leave it <laughs> on site and $200,000 is going away. So we have the tools and the expertise uh, to uh, provide this assistance and definitely we can uh, take advantage of uh, other expertise across UCR and California, and of course, uh, nature conservation. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I would I would just like. I would just like to echo um, what Uri is saying about modeling. I was thinking about one, one of our best tools um, is actually uh, satellite imagery, which can give us data on a number of parameters with respect to groundwater, soil moisture, and a lot of that, um, it, a lot of that data is coming directly into J, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is right over in Pasadena. So locally here in Southern California, we have access to a, a, a lot of really advanced resources um, that we can link to what we're seeing on the ground. And this is something that I do in my own research. We measure plants very locally at a particular site, um, and we collaborate with landscape ecologists who have satellite imagery. And then to, to link the two of them is really, it's math and models to, to link those two scales. And so, um, so working across those scales is a big challenge, but in this type of, of investigation, I, I really think that that would be a great tool and a really good way forward. And I also have to say it's, it's exciting um, that this management plan is creating new opportunities uh, and actually calling out for some of the research that we do. Um, there, there's 
a need for us to know about drought resistance of different communities, a need to know about groundwater dynamics and how that all comes together. So this is a, an exciting time where some of the tools that we use might, might be really useful. And it's also, it's also exciting to see um, a situation where we're planning in advance um, for future droughts instead of responding to them. Um, two of my last uh, NSF grants have been in response to a drought, going out to see what died and what lived and why. And um, the idea of getting some of this in place before the next drought catastrophe happens, I think is a really forward, forward thinking way of doing this. So I'm, I'm quite pleased. And it, it's, it's been, um, sometimes these things are, are hard to predict. Uh, for example, at, at my study site, we got an NSF grant to go out and see what died in the Great California Drought of four years, and um, none of the species at my site in the desert experienced um, elevated mortality. So this is something that we wouldn't have been able to predict, um, but perhaps by getting on this early and taking the right measurements to, to have the right data before a drought, it'll give us better insights and greater predictability as to how these ecosystems will respond. questions to any of the members, either the panel or the speaker. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes. Yes. Just on your Sorry. last point. Oh, you right? Yes. yes. Hi, I'm Holly. I'm a environmental engineering PhD student. I study more quality, but um, I've worked with consultant fee a bit, and so to your last point about the importance of having data before a crisis, um, a lot of these areas we clean out in maybe rural areas or aren't that many people, or maybe they're in band communities, so they're not really prioritizing and it's a data question a lot of the time. So how do we ensure that that happens for both the science and the policymakers to address those issues? So I, I imagine that um, some decisions would have to be made on the value of ecosystems. And Melissa showed an example of different ecosystems having different ecological value. And I would imagine that the ones that have the most ecological value are the ones that um, some effort should be made to measure. And how that would get done between these local communities, the TMC, um, the state uh, agencies that are managing water, I'm, I'm not sure how that would all work, how the, how the moving pieces would come together. Um, but it, it seems clear that it wouldn't be too hard to prioritize where we would need data first and, and um, what those sites would be. But did, that, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to emphasize their role of models <laughs> very much as a modeler though, but also we can kind of simulate what happened in the past, try to replicate and then use additional data sets, you know, you may not have the same plant records, but there is a lot of paleo climate information that we can use to validating whether we can replicate the past as well. But again, I would like to emphasize the role of data and uh, yeah, without new data collections and merging data with the big models, uh, models otherwise it's uh, too garbage. But there is a possibility to, to go back as well and see what was in the past. Yes, they, they could be very deep rooted uh, vegetation uh, as well. But I'm not an ecologist to, to answer that. But yes, there is, and uh, maybe you can uh, comment on that too. We, in our modeling effort, we need to specify where is the rooting depth uh, is, so we can set the threshold for, for the groundwater level and as it ups and downs. But one interesting for me as a hydrologist uh, observations looking at uh, plants is the process of hydraulic lift that uh, actually the deeper roots can access the water and extract it and bring it to the shallower layers for vegetation uh, to, to use. 
And you know, this is something that at least in the hydrologic modeling community, we don't have these processes formulated, but uh, always I think um, ecological community surprises us. Um, yes, definitely uh, deep-rooted uh, ecosystems. Um, oaks tend to be deep-rooted. Um, some of the shrubs in the chaparral and coastal sage ecosystems are very deep-rooted, often growing right next to another species that's shallow-rooted. So there's a lot of variability um, in our ecosystems in Southern California in terms of how plants get their water. Um, I would say as, as we go into wetter ecosystems, conifers tend to be more shallow rooted. And uh, in riparian situations, it really varies a lot depending on, on the subsurface structure of, of the soil. So, um, so yes, a lot of this uh, has to do with deeper rooting. How deep is another question. We've measured um, below three meters. So we can say they're absorbed, taking water up from more than three meters depth. How much deeper, we don't know. Um, but it could be quite a bit because we're not seeing groundwater at three meters down. Can you can you stand up and so that we can hear you? I was in Australia during the, when the uh, actually the Australian government allocated fifty million dollars to establish the National Center for Groundwater Research and Training. That's why I, I went there for four years and they done great work, but unfortunately yes, due to political change after five years that the money uh, uh, finished, you know, the uh, Australian government decided not to, to renew the, the center and people bring money. Uh, from other resources, but uh, yes, that's one of the leading uh, kind of countries in terms of looking at groundwater dependent ecosystems and uh, groundwater vegetation interaction. And, and on our website, we have uh, additional resources. We have links to a lot of really great work that's been done on this topic outside of California and also within California. So if you're interested, check out um, those links on our website. So I, I have the last question. For Lou and Melissa, and maybe also for Kubi. So, this is got kind of a, a question that uh, tries to uh, 
reduction in the level of groundwater, uh, we see some ecosystems that are suffering or disappearing, and other ecosystems are rising in uh, in the same uh, or under the same or over the same aquifer. So instead of uh, us as uh, humans interfering in what we can think as a long-term change uh, that is following, let's say, climate change, uh, not, uh, not necessarily because of human uh, bad management, but due to some natural situations. And we, we can see that you know, some of the ecosystems are moving from south to north now. Uh, and uh, you know, Canada is expected to be the major producer of wheat uh, those areas in, in northern Canada, for example. So maybe it's not that bad, and uh, maybe we should let nature or the ecosystems that are stronger and more fit to the new situation uh, survive, and the others disappear. That's, that's my, you know, <laughs> question uh, for Lou. I know uh -huh. that we talked about some competition between ecosystems in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would like to know what you think about this. So it, it is true that as we heat the atmosphere, that there is a natural progression of species migrations. Um, species are moving uphill in, in some cases, moving further north. Um, and so that's related to temperature. Um, and as, as long as we keep heating the atmosphere, that's going to happen at a slow rate. Um, I, I think related to groundwater, that, that process is, is a process that we wouldn't want to worsen by pumping groundwater and limiting the amount of water that would otherwise be available over natural ecosystems. So um, as that process takes place, we, we have the, the potential to make it worse um, by, by extracting too much water. So by at least leaving a, a reasonable amount of, of water in, in these aquifers so that natural processes can take place, I think that is somewhat of a buffer against, um, against ecological change happening too fast. Um, because if ecological change happens too fast, um, systems can reach tipping points, as, as Melissa um, hinted at. In California, it's vegetation die back and then fire, and then mudslides, um, and then the loss of ecosystem services. So we, we've seen this cycle before. Um, I think it's up to us to manage resources effectively as, as to not to speed it up. Can I comment on the other hydrologists? I would be bored. Okay, that's with the new equilibrium condition will happen and we have new vegetation communities, but uh, we are depleting our streams because in many areas also groundwater is connected to a stream and the drought flow will stop, so our streams run dry and the, another issue is the issue of subsidence that, you know, could be uh, impacting and have human This is a very interesting discussion. Um, so there are, I, I think it's important to remember the services that these ecosystems provide for us. Um, you know, uh, climate change is definitely, it's one of the things that concerns me the most um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and these ecosystems have the ability to sequester carbon. So. At, but my concern with your your, your comment, Ariel, is that um, these I don't we don't want to see these ecosystems moving anywhere. <laughs> they're kind of, they're the last remaining um, ecosystem, and a lot of them are found in kind of like these depression areas where the ground water uh, the the land surface is, is lower, so sort of they, they can actually reach the groundwater. And so there's nowhere really for them to move. Um, they're tapping into groundwater, and and and, and so. Um, the, it's kind of the, the last the last bit and there are some um, functional changes in the community of these ecosystems um, but as we saw with that picture with the Arundo, a lot of times when these groundwater levels are dropping or um, dropping too fast or uh, uh, the magnitude is too great you start
start to get uh, opportunistic species that can dominate the ecosystem. So then you lose biodiversity, and then you also will have a functional shift in that ecosystem. And so a lot of the ecosystem services that it may have provided are no longer there. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for coming from the, to the uh, World Water Day 2018. Uh, just an announcement. Next week, we, we are going to have a very interesting seminar uh, in our series, which is on uh, impact, health impacts of water scarcity. And uh, this will be taking place in the seminar room of the School of Public Policy, IMPS, and of course, we will get all the announcements uh, on time. Thank you very much.